Good afternoon, everyone. We want to thank you all for participating in our Tech Nation webinar Wednesday series. We are thrilled with the tremendous turnout for today's presentation with over 550 attendees registered. Tech Nation is proud to offer these free webinars as a way to educate and provide valuable information to the healthcare technology industry. These same speakers and presentations are held at our biannual MD Expo. Our next MD Expo will be held March 29th to the 31st in Nashville, Tennessee. For more information, please visit mdexposhow.com. A few notes before we begin. Your participation today makes you eligible for one and a half CE credits. A survey about today's presentation will appear on your computer screen immediately following today's webinar. Once the survey is complete, we will email you your certificate within one week of today. Earlier today, registrants were emailed a Webinar Wednesday workbook. If you did not receive a copy, you can download one by visiting iamtechnation.com forward slash webinars and clicking on today's presentation. During today's webinar, all lines will be muted, but you can submit questions throughout the presentation by using the questions feature on the dashboard on the right-hand side of your screen. We will stop throughout the presentation to pose those questions to the speaker. TechNation would like to thank our sponsor today, RPI. Since 1972, RPI has reverse engineered parts to meet or exceed OEM performance requirements for hospital, medical, dental, and lab equipment. They are proud to offer quality replacement parts and excellent customer service. Our presenter today is Neil Blagman, who has a BS in Biology and Computer Science from the State University of New York. With more than 25 years of hands-on experience in the biomedical field, Mr. Blagman uses his wealth of knowledge in his current position as a product development engineer for RPI. Along with developing parts for RPI, Mr. Blagman responds to customers' requests for technical support via phone, email, and published articles. In particular, he has developed a keen sense of troubleshooting and finding repair solutions for tabletop sterilizers. With that being said, Neil, the floor is yours. Good morning. This is Neil, Technical Support Department at RPI. Today we're talking about tabletop sterilizers. We're going to be going into some of the history of tabletop sterilizers, some of the um, processes that are used, why they work, how they work. And we're going to look at how the industry has developed from the simplest machines in today's more complex systems and try to relate that to um, bulk sterilizers for those people that are working on those. Um, okay, let's begin. The role of biomedical engineers have developed uh, in recent history to include more and more opportunities outside of their traditional role in the hospital. As biomeds and service technicians get into clinics and laboratory situations, they're seeing more and more uh, tabletop sterilizers and more and more smaller systems. Today we're going to be talking about them. We're going to be using uh, the example of the Midmark Ultraclave to demonstrate some of the processes that the machine goes through and try to relate it to the larger machines. I will be uh, taking questions and uh, will be happy to answer um, anyone's questions. Um, also, uh, if we do run out of time, we can do that. I will be happy to take questions offline through our technical support department. Tabletop sterilizer world has a number of different manufacturers. What you're looking at right now is a list of the more common manufacturers. Some of these people have are still making machines. Some of them no longer are uh, pro being produced, but the uh, independent service technicians will recognize many of these names as still in existence. These machines are still being used by uh, their customers. So um, just to kind of start the history of the tabletop sterilizer, we can trace it back to the 1600s when a product named the digester was being produced. 
The digester was used in the food industry as a cooking device. It is still in production today as a pressure cooker. Basically what you had was a sealed uh, vessel that could be opened and closed at will. You would put water, food, put it on a heat source. The heat source would boil the water, creating steam. The steam was con contained within the pressure vessel, and um, that uh, increases the pressure of the steam and, and decreases the cooking time. This, also, this device also translates to something called a pressure pot, exactly the same as a pressure cooker. In this case, though, we are using it to uh, sterilize industrial uh, pieces of equipment, um, and we also use them as a steam source. The uh, system on the left-hand side, the one I'm pointing at, is from our QC lab. We use that as part of our testing. The one on the right is a Prestige. This is a sterilizer that would be found in um, a spa or a beauty salon to sterilize scissors um, and uh, nail clippers. Um, basically what you have is a heating element in a pot of water, which you have to put the water in every use. Inside of both of these you'd find a tray where, where you would put some small cassettes for loose instruments. No matter what you're talking about in the world of sterilization, um, there are very simple, um, they, they, the, the world of sterilization requires three unique characteristics. We're always going to be talking about temperature, we're always going to be talking about pressure, and we're always going to be talking about exposure time. The temperature is something that we have to set based on the kinds of uh, materials going in the sterilizer. We don't want to melt anything, we don't want to burn anything, so that's based on the actual um, pieces, what we're trying to do with the sterilizer. The pressure is related to the temperature. When you take steam and contain it, there is a ratio between the temperature and pressure that will always be maintained in the working machine. That ratio of pressure to temperature is uh, based on sea level measurements. If you are, a, if you are at altitude, uh, that ratio changes slightly, and people who are at high cities uh, will always be adjusting their cycles to compensate for that. Now, the exposure time is based on the machine uh, running properly, being at its stable operating temperature and pressure, and is decided by the manufacturers to ensure that 100% of bacterial spores within the sterilizer are killed under every possible opportunity. Um, normally that's set up so that they actually do 200% kills or 100% twice. Um, normally if the, if the manufacturer says that they can uh, kill the bacterial spores in a minute and a half, they'll run the cycle for three minutes to ensure that they're completely killed. Now, what are we talking about in a bacterial spore? Uh, there are, as part of the bacteriums, certain bacteriums life cycle, they literally form a case, it's basically the DNA of the bacteria with proteins surrounding it. It's very, very hard to penetrate that protein shell, so we absolutely need to be sure that we have enough energy within the system to break down that wall. Um, if we, in order to do that, we need a good conductor of heat as well as energy. Steam is the ideal conductor. It's very penetrating and it can hold a lot of energy and transfer it very uniformly. You can also sterilize using just dry heat, but in order to do that, you would have to increase the time, exposure time and increase the temperature, which limits the amount of, uh, and the style of instruments that can be dry sterilized. Okay. Now,
Now, talking about steam, and this is an illustration that we're using to show the pressure pots we were talking about earlier. Here we have the heating element in the water that we put in to begin with. We're going to um, heat that water to boiling. And what we want to produce in this situation is uh, a flow of steam that is uh, saturated with water. Saturate, the definition of saturated steam is the situation where you have water droplets suspended as steam particles and you have solid water. Once you've stepped away from the point where you no longer have solid water and you've converted as all of the water into steam, you have now superheated it. And at the point that you superheat steam, you can actually increase its temperature uh, to where you can use superheated steam to cut steel. Uh, superheated steam is, is um, not a good choice for sterilizing instruments. It tends to melt things. It's not as controllable. What we want is to make sure that we have our a water, some sort of water within the chamber at all times. As we were talking earlier, we mentioned that there is a ratio between pressure and temperature of exposed saturated steam. This only applies to saturated steam. This chart uh, gives us an idea of what we are looking for when the machine is being run. And under normal uh, sterilization, uh, we would be looking somewhere in the range of 24 to 29 PSI with temperatures in the 270s to 272 degrees. That's the normal operating conditions for uh, tabletop sterilizers. Now back to the um, pressure pots we were talking about earlier, we have a problem inherent within a pressure pot in that they tend to stratify the steam. Um, when you started the machine, you started with this chamber cold and you heated the water and the water uh, started to produce steam and it's very hard for steam to heat air. The transfer of energy between steam and air takes a very long time and requires a lot of uh, temperature change. So under normal circumstances, the air would be con compressed on the top of the steam. So you wind up with a situation where you have stratified your steam. You have light steam on the top, you have denser steam on the bottom, and you have no circulation of steam within the chamber. Now, if you're only doing um, scissors and nail clippers, that's okay. There's no uh, little entries that need to get steam exposure. This will work very well for those instruments, but anything more complicated, we need to be able to actually circulate the steam within the packs, move it around, get it to the point where it gets good exposure within all of the um, little pit, pits and containers and chambers within the instruments. Um, you know, I am seeing that we have some questions already being generated, and I'd like to take an opportunity at this point to try to catch up on a few of them. So can we get a few? Uh, yes, Neil, we do have a couple of questions here. Uh, the first one is, what else can cause a spore test to fail? Um, that is an excellent question. A spore test is designed to not look at how the sterilizer is running. It's designed to look at the technique that was used to load the sterilizer. It also looks at the technique of which which cycles were chosen for the particular load. If we look at the image on the right here, that circulating steam has to be able to penetrate all of the various packs and the spore test that's used. If you bury the spore test amongst the packs, 
If there's no flow of steam within the sterilizer, that will cause the pack to fail, even if the machine was operating properly. If you run out of water and superheat the steam, that can actually cause the steam to stop circulating and cause the spore test to fail. Also, spore tests are dated. They have a limited lifespan, and you must use them before they outdate. Next question. Okay, uh, this is from an, another attendee. As part of preventive maintenance, what is the direct or indirect method to check the temperature in the chamber during the cycle because the door is being sealed? Uh, that's a very good question. We, there is a device that we'll be talking about later in the presentation called a lag thermometer. Um, it acts just like an old-fashioned fever thermometer that you have to shake down between uses um, so that when you uh, put the lag thermometer inside the chamber. It records the maximum temperature that that chamber uh, reached during the run, and that's really what we are most concerned about at that point. We aren't concerned necessarily about how long it was maintained at that temperature. We just want to be sure that we got to the temperature that the machine told us we got to, it, that it agrees with the gauges, and that uh, is part of the way we set the cycle up. Got any more? Yep, one more here. How many cycles need to run for, ster for the sterilizer? Um, I'm, I'm not sure I understood the question exactly, but um, we want to be able to sterilize our whatever we're putting in the machine within one cycle. We don't want to have to do them twice. And um, there are various cycles based on the kind of materials that are put in. Um, if you are using wrapped instruments or wrapped packs, you need to have greater penetration of the steam. So you'd want it to take a longer sterilization time. On the mid-mark machines that we're talking about today, an unwrapped cycle is three minutes but a packed cycle or a wrap cycle would be closer to five minutes. Also, if you are going to do things like sterilize liquids or gels for the bacterial labs, you don't want them to boil, so we vent the machine differently based on the material that's being put in the sterilizer. Okay, um, is there any other ones or shall we continue? Uh, let's go ahead and continue, Neil. Thank you. Okay, very good. So moving right along, oh, back. Well, let me get introduce the next slide. Um, after uh, these pressure pots were laid out, there was a um, an invention made that allowed a pressure pot to actually circulate steam to help it move around within the chamber of the device. It's called a bellows. This is a device that's attached externally to the pressure pot and allows a bit of, of steam and the cold air to escape the pressure pot so that we no longer have it trapped and we no longer stratify our steam. Basically, this device has a bellows in it, these um, two plates that expand at the boil. There's a liquid within those plates that expands around the boiling point of water. This device moves a uh, sealing surface against the uh, bottom of the uh, bellows, and that stops the flow of steam and air through the bellows long enough for it to cool down below the boiling point of water the water, the material contained within the bellows uh, condenses, the bellows opens up, and it allows a slug of air and steam to flow through the bellows. Now, um, this is the device as originally produced by Midmark. Uh, we also offer a upgrade to it. It's a multi-convoluted bellows. Uh, this device needs to move each of these bellows less distance. 
works the same way, though, uh, based on uh, the expansion rate of a fluid contained within the bellows. But because it moves each bellows less distance, it's more reliable and has a smaller temperature window between opening and closing. Also uh, used in the same way is a device called a steam trap. This actually has a slug of wax mounted within this rectangular area, and uh, that wax has a known expansion coefficient. So it basically expands, uh, moving this rod into a sealing surface, and again, uh, interrupts the flow of air and steam through the bellows. So by adding these devices to our pressure pot, we now have moved into the realm of an actual sterilizer. This is a diagram of the Midmark or Ritter M7. And basically what you're looking at is we have a separate reservoir for our water. We have a single valve that allows the flow of water into the chamber and steam back out of the chamber. We have um, a way for the air and any light steam to be taken off the top of the chamber. That gets past a temperature gauge so we know that the machine has reached its operating temperature. And we have the bellows we were just talking about earlier that allows that steam within the chamber to circulate properly. And it allows us to get that cold air and light steam off of the top of the chamber. Um, that material is dumped back into the reservoir where it condenses and uh, into water, which we can reuse. So we're not having to put water in this on every single cycle. Also, when the steam is released back into the reservoir, it goes through something called a condensing coil. This is an open-ended uh, copper coil that allows the steam to condense back into water for reuse. So this is basically the simplest version of a sterilizer. Now we're going to take a step up into a slightly more complicated version. This is the valve assembly to a Pelton and Crane OCM or OCR. Um, it's a unique device. It actually has uh, flowing water through it, flowing steam through it, and 120 volts AC all within the same device. It's pretty amazing that it can keep AC separated from all that water, but um, it allows us to move the uh, steam more efficiently into and out of the chamber. Uh, again, it is actually manually driven by a camshaft, pressing on two rods that either let, steam, let water into the chamber or steam out of the chamber, but it still requires the intervention of uh, a technician. Moving right along, we're talking about the differences between, I'm sorry, the similarities between automatic sterilizers and the manual machines we were just talking about. Um, they all use water. They all have specific cycles. They use some valves. We have output devices and timers. Every one of these devices, every one of these machines has a safety device. Um, we have to have a way to seal the door, so we have a door gasket, valves, and various filters. When we step away from a manual machine to an automatic machine, we're taking the responsibility of moving the cycle forward away from the technicians so that um, they can set the machine and uh, not have to worry about um, coming, uh, coming back to the machine. When they come back to the machine, it will be, the machine will be finished. Um, so um, I believe we had uh, some questions. Is there any questions up until this point? Let's try to get a few more in if there are any. Hi, Neil. We do have one. 
how often do we have to perform preventive maintenance on the sterilizer? Is it 12 months, 6 months, or 3 months? Uh, we recommend 12 months preventative maintenance on these machines, but there are also things that um, should be done by the operator on a daily, a weekly, and a monthly basis. On a daily basis, you need to make sure that the water is kept clean and changed out. Uh, we don't want any bio buildup, bio burden buildup within our reservoir or with inside the chamber of the machine. On a weekly level, your technicians should be cleaning the machine to make sure that we don't build up any uh, residue from cleaning products used on the instruments or from the instruments themselves or the wrappings that are used. And then on a monthly basis, you should be checking your safety relief valve to be sure that um, there are um, that it's functioning properly and that it reseals after each use. Uh, okay, um, let's move on. Okay, the next question is: Is it okay to interchange steam trap with bellows type valves? Um, it is okay. They both function under the uh, exactly the same way. Um, the only difference is in the technology, and we have not found that uh, any um, disadvantages to uh, one way or the other instead of a steam trap over a bellows. Uh, the intent was that the steam trap, because it contains less flexing um, devices, would last longer. And there is some anecdotal evidence to say that it does, but uh, it is just as likely to be uh, become uh, damaged by uh, dirt or material getting into the sealing surfaces. So depending upon the cleanliness of the machine, the steam trap may not last uh, any longer than the bellows. Okay, one final question for now. Uh, do tabletop stair do tabletops require state permits similar to larger sterilizers due to being a pressure vessel? If not, then why? The permitting system is different for tabletop sterilizers as opposed to bulk sterilizers because of where they're being used and the regulatory agencies that are over, that um, uh, overview the usage of these products. Um, all sterilizers that are produced for sale in the United States are ASME certified. That means that the materials that went into building the sterilizer were certified as appropriate and that uh, the various safety devices are set up so that the operator is protected and in many cases such as a small clinic or a dental office that are not cons not covered by things like Jayco that's uh, appropriate for that situation. Um, now there are uh, several states that are looking actually into increasing the certification for such things as small clinics, uh, dental offices, and uh, uh, any, any place that a sterilizer would be used in a spa or a beauty parlor, but that's on a state-by-state -state basis and that would be your state regulators that should be involved with that. Any other questions? Uh, we'll go ahead and proceed with the presentation at this point. Okay, if we don't get to, for the attendees, if we don't get to your question at this time, RPI will follow up with all answers at the conclusion of the presentation. Very good. So now we're back to talking about the differences between automatic and manual sterilizers. Um, automatic sterilizers give us an opportunity for uh, self-contained diagnostics, uh, troubleshooting uh, uh, cycles, and uh, we get uh, codes that can be outputted to tell us what has happened during the cycle. We get an opportunity to hook up a printer that tells us 
on a moment-by-moment -moment basis exactly what the sterilizer believed happened and uh, can be used as record keeping so that you can have a, a permanent record that the instruments did complete a cycle. Um, we do have automatic sterilizers that monitor not only the internal temperature of the chamber, but the external temperature of the chamber so that we can be absolutely sure that the environment of the heating elements um, is, is being, are, are operating properly and that we're reaching the temperatures that we expect to reach. Um, we have timing circuits that allow the flow of fluid through electronic valves. Um, we have uh, dams and water gaskets that allow us to control the flow of fluid within the sterilizer. This is basically what an automatic sterilizer's microprocessor has to be able to integrate. We have information from sensors, temperature probes, uh, pressure sensors, water level sensors, overheat sensors, and what the user actually has asked the machine to do, the cycle inputs. Outputs, we have an opportunity to tell the operator that there's a, a problem. We have information displays. We can control valves and we can output to a printer. Moving right along, on the automated sterilizers, instead of having a mechanical valve that someone has to actually move forward, we have an electronically controlled valve. This is the valve to the Midmark M9, M11 manure style machines. Um, it contains a valve for filling the chamber and a valve for venting the steam out of the chamber. It is uh, AC driven by a coil that um, pulls a piston off of a seat and allows the flow of fluid into or out of the valve. Um, we, did, we, we have a demonstration on the disassembly of that valve, so we're going to go through it, um, give you an idea of this being the most complicated part of the machine, what it takes to actually make this happen. So you need a few tools. Uh, the first thing you're going to do is, of course, unplug the machine from the wall and drain the water out of the reservoir. And when you are ready to disassemble the valves, we need to electrically disconnect them. Move that out of the way. Then we're going to start disassembling the copperware using a, a half-inch box wrench. Moving along, there's an adapter we'll need to take out with a three-quarter inch box wrench. There's a nut that also can be removed with the same wrench on the top of the valve housing. Here we've removed both of the nuts, both of the valve housings, and both of the coils. And you can see that I've set them aside, try to get them out of the way. We're using a device called a spanner wrench to remove the flute off of the valve. That's the part that contains the piston. And we're using a uh, screwdriver as a breaker bar to actually open up that uh, flute. There are two pins at the end of this tool that are engaged in two little openings on the top of the bonnet and uh, we're going to spin that out. We've removed both of them at this point and I've sat them aside and we have both of our pistons exposed. What, I'm trying, what I was trying to show you at this point is the sealing surfaces of these pistons. On the left hand side valve, that's the fill valve, it is a normally closed valve and the sealing surface is the bottom of the piston. This spring presses that piston down and until we actually activate the coil, that valve stays closed. Uh, once we activate the coil, you allow water to flow from the reservoir into the chamber. 
The other, um, well, here we're showing, we're pointing towards the ceiling surface. On the other piston, we have a ceiling surface that is actually at the top of the piston, and it's that little red uh, spot right here. It seals against an opening in the top of the bonnet, and because the spring presses down on this piston, this would be considered a normally open valve. The machine will vent any air inside the chamber through this normally open valve until we actually engage the coil, pulling this piston up and sealing it inside here. Okay, um, we've been talking about the Midmark M9, M11, and just to clarify, this machine was made in two separate styles. We kind of return, refer to them as a older style and a newer style. The older style has red LEDs as a display. The newer style has a green liquid crystal display. And um, the, if, if you are ever going to go to one of these machines and you need to figure out which machine we're talking about, they can identify it by whether it's got red LEDs or green liquid crystal display. It's pretty easy for the users to tell that. The red LED displays are the Midmark versions dash 001 through 019. The green liquid crystal display is the versions dash 020 through dash 022. Um, and we're going to be looking at this version for the rest of the procedure, the rest of this program. Okay. So, we're going to talk about running a typical cycle on this Dash 20, Midmark Dash 20 M9 or M11. The first part of the cycle would be the filling of the chamber. Basically what we've done is we are going to, uh, we've got the door sealed and we're going to pick a cycle. The machine is going to automatically open the valve and it's going to allow water to flow from the reservoir into the chamber. This water level is set by a uh, device mounted in the back of the chamber called a water level sensor. The water will rise until it touches the water level sensor, which completes a circuit within the electronics of the machine and shuts the valve. Now, um, going through the process of starting the machine, we're going to select a cycle, and as you can see here, we are selecting an unwrap cycle. That unwrap cycle will run at 270 degrees Fahrenheit for three minutes. In order to start the cycle, we have to have the door closed, water in the reservoir, and we have to hit the start button. And that's exactly what we're doing here. So um, we are looking at the machine. The next thing that the machine tells us is that it's filling the chamber. And we have an elapsed clock that we started uh, on the left-hand side of your screen so you can have an idea how far we've gone into the cycle. Okay, so it's taken about 20 seconds. The water has filled into the chamber. The water level sensor has been triggered, and we get a message saying that the chamber is now full. The machine will now go into its second phase, which is, a heating, which is heating the water. Um, this process starts the generation of steam, and um, we will be um, allowing that steam to build up within the chamber. Um, and we will be moving some of that steam out of the chamber to clean the air and any light steam out of the way. Now, this is different from 
the Midmark M9, M11, 01s through 19s as we no longer are using the bellows we were talking about earlier. We actually now have a valve that takes the place of a bellows. It has to be opened periodically during the heat up phase to allow that uh, air, trapped air and steam to come out of the reservoir, uh, out of the chamber. Um, one thing that we don't have illustrated on this slide, there's a safety relief valve mounted on the top of the chamber. Should something happen within this chamber that uh, allows the steam to become uh, overpressurized, that safety relief valve would release and that would uh, prevent anyone from being hurt or the door blowing open or something bad happening. So um, what we're going to do now is I'm going to uh, play a little audio clip of what the machine sounds like as that valve is being released. Um, this is about, we can see on our lapse clock, we've gone four and a half minutes into the cycle. And this is the first time that that valve is being opened. Um, hang on, we'll play it, and then I'll get back and show you what's going on on the screen. Okay, so we've uh, opened the valve and released the steam. Now, what you would normally see on the screen is the, um, the pressure taking a, a drop. Um, I think you probably saw it went from about 10 PSI down to about 8 PSI, and as it came back up again, We've reheated, we, we've allowed the water in the chamber to flash to steam. We've built up more pressure within the chamber. We haven't built up a lot of heat yet. Right now, we still have trapped air within the chamber. So we're going to go ahead and release that valve a second time. And again, we're going to show you visually what happens as, as that valve opens. Right now we're at 13.6 PSI. The steam pressure is going to drop, but the temperature isn't going to change very much as the mass of the steel within the chamber kind of acts as a, a heat sink. So we really don't change temperature very much, but you can definitely see the pressure going down. Uh, we're going to do that a third time to ensure that all of the trapped air is gone. And visually, we'll see that we're going from 13.6 and 246 degrees back down a bit, not nearly as far because the steam flashes very, very quickly. And now we're going to be building up actually towards our sterilization temperature. Um, you can imagine if you have an un, a, a new operator uh, who just happens to walk by the machine when it was doing one of those uh, steam releases, they tend to get a little uh, freaked out about it. They watch their gauge go crazy. And um, in some cases, they will even try to call for service. And um, you get the unique thrill of telling them that, no, that's how the machine is supposed to operate. So um, now we're going to continue heating to, we're at 8 minutes, 27 seconds. We're going to continue heating until we reach the sterilization point. That means we have met the requirements of the program for both temperature and pressure. And the way that is determined, there is a temperature sensor mounted in the back of the chamber. 
and we also have a line to a pressure sensor that's mounted on the circuit board. Um, both of that, both of those pieces of information are used by the microprocessor on the circuit board to determine whether the machine has actually reached sterilization. When um, we do that, what we'll see, in, and now we've gone to 12 minutes, the machine has met what the, what the uh, requirements were for the cycle. It's at 271 degrees Fahrenheit, and we are at 28.6 PSI, and the machine will automatically start down, uh, start a three-minute cycle count. Okay, we've actually completed the three minutes of sterilization exposure. The machine was con continued along at somewhere between 271, and now we can see we've gotten a little bit hotter to 273 degrees, and we're at 29 psi, perfectly exposed uh, sterilization cycle for an unwrapped PAX. We're going to move on to the next step in the process is when we vent the steam from the chamber. Okay, so um, what happens now is the machine automatically opens up the vent solenoid and we use the steam within the chamber to force any water that's in the bottom of the chamber as well as the steam back through this fitting through the vent valve into the reservoir where there is a condensing coil and that steam is turned back into water for our next uh, opportunity for the next cycle. And um, just to uh, kind of put something on um, so you can hear what it sounds like. We have a little sound clip of the machine actually venting. Whoops, hang on, back one. Yeah, we, we lost one. Hang on. There we go. This is the sound clip of the machine venting. And what you would visually see while that process was going on, the temperature would be dropping, the pressure would be dropping, until we reach the point that the pressure has reached zero PSI, and um, we are ready to now automatically open up the door. The Midmark M9, M11 does have an automatic door opener that does what's called open air drying. Um, the machine will actually release the door, some steam will come out, and it will make a sound something like this. And that was, that was the loud thunk of the door opening. Um, normally you would see uh, some small amount of steam escaping the machine, and there might even be a little bit of condensed water on the bottom. And then uh, this is going to uh, dry as part of our cycle for five minutes. It's a countdown timer. We're just going to let it proceed. We're now at 17 minutes on our cycle count. And when that's finished, we will have gotten to 22 minutes, and the machine will make a noise telling the operator it is finished. Okay, that actually completes the cycle. And at this point, before we go into our troubleshooting tips, I'd like to take an opportunity to get any questions. Are there any questions? Yes, we do have some here, Neil. Okay, here's one. Is there any difference between your 
Pelton and Crane Cleaner and your Midmark Cleaner? Absolutely, and a really great question. All of the cleaning products designed for sterilizers are unique to the manufacturer of the sterilizer. Different manufacturers use different materials and different processes. The cleaners are designed to only work with their style machines. Our, our Midmark cleaner should only be used with a Midmark machine. The Pelton cleaner should only be used in a Pelton machine. Tuttenauer cleaner should only be used in a Tuttenauer. You do not want to interchange them. Damage to the machine can occur or damage to the um, uh, stainless steel of the chambers or to the uh, valve seats and various uh, parts of the system. Okay, our next question. What are the symptoms to look for to see if the air vent valve is faulty? Um, the air vent valve is designed to remove cold air and cool steam off of the chamber. So you want, to, you want to first of all actually hear or see it activated. You want to see the steam pressure dropping. You want to know that it actually functioned. And that steam pressure and the sound that it makes is important. You want that steam to flow with some authority. You want the valve to open enough that the steam flows and doesn't just trickle. If it's going to flow through very, very slowly, it's not going to be efficient at removing the cold air out of the chamber. So we want to be sure that that valve opens fully, that there's no restrictions within it or restrictions between the valve itself and the chamber. Also, as part of that process, we're checking that the condensing coil, which all that air and all that steam flows through, is uh, not restricted as well. Um, on the newer style machines, the M9, M11-20 through 22s, there was some problems with back pressure on the condensing line. And for those of you who have actually replaced the condensing coil in the newer style M9 and M11, you'll find a very small hole in the top of the condensing coil. That is supposed to be there. It's there uh, by, by design of the manufacturer. And it removes some of the back pressure that the condensing coil can generate. Um, that is a difference between the parts in the newer style machine and the older style machines that you should be paying attention to. Any more questions? Okay, one more here before you move on. In an automatic sterilizer, is there a message that will appear on the display showing that the door is ready to open after sterilizing? Um, there is a message saying that you have completed the vent process and that the door is getting ready to open. Yes, it, there, there is a message that you get. And it does say door is going to open. Shall we move on? Uh, yes, at this time, go ahead and proceed. OK. So now we're going to um, go through some technical tips that we have found um, by talking to various customers, things that we pay attention to and we tell our customers to pay attention to when they're working on the machine. In order to do this, we basically have uh, drained the machine, we've turned it on its side, and we have removed an, a plate that's mounted on the bottom so you can actually see the bottom of the sterilizer. Um, so when working under the machine, you should pay attention to a few things. There is, this is where the heating element comes through, and we have connections to um, our uh, circuit board for uh, 120 volts AC to uh, come on to the heating element. These are quick connect fittings that over time can oxidize. You need to pay attention to them. Also, there is a series of seals 
around the heating elements to keep the steam in that you need to pay attention to. If you ever see buildup of any sort of calcium or lime here, or if you actually see water anywhere near this, you need to be sus you need to make sure that those seals have not failed. Uh, the way this sealing system works is there is a single fiber o-ring that goes on the heating element bushing that goes inside the chamber. Then on the outside there is a second washer um, as well as a silver lock washer that's held in place by a nut. All those should be tight and uh, sealed properly. We also have a series two temperature switches. These are over temperature switches that tell the machine when it has overheated. They are safety devices. They have to be functional. One of the problems we have found is that these connections over time can become oxidized. If you actually are working in with electricity, you'll know that oxidation creates resistance resistance creates temperature, and you actually can build up a small amount of temperature within these connectors, and we want to make sure that they are not artificially triggering these uh, safety with these thermal switches early. Um, these thermal switches are very important. The reason they normally trigger is because you've run out of water within the chamber, the steam has superheated. The wall of the chamber has overheated to the point that it releases these uh, devices, and you need to figure out why that has happened and where the water has gone. We also have a connection to our main valve assembly. It is uh, a copper tubing with a swaged uh, uh, fitting. Um, this device needs to be sealed. We don't want to see any accumulated uh, uh, calcium or lime anywhere on here. We don't want to see any water accumulated on here. So we want to be sure that we've got this sealed. Now, if you start to see problems with this joint, this joint is welded in place, this is not a non-repairable uh, problem. We do not We do not recommend doing any repairs to a sterilizer chamber. You cannot weld them. You need to be ASME certified to do that kind of work. It is not advised. Once these seals fail, this one around here, the chamber needs to be replaced. Please don't try to have them repaired. Okay, so we've now taken the machine, turned it on, back up in its normal operating position, and we've removed the right-hand panel so that you can see the main circuit board and the various components surrounding it. Um, so we have um, one circuit board. This is the newer style machine, so we have a smaller circuit board mounted on a metal bracket. Um, attached to that circuit board. We have a piece of neoprene tubing that is connected to the chamber and allows the pressure to come to the circuit board. This neoprene tubing is held in place by two tie wraps. These two tie wraps are critical. They must be in place. If you, even if you're just doing some diagnostic with the machine or testing, these tie wraps need to be here. A leak at this point in the system, even a very small leak, will throw the whole machine's uh, readings off and can be very problematic. Um, moving right along, we're going to talk about the main circuit board. Since we have two different styles of machines, we have two different styles of circuit boards. And because they are different, style, different sizes and mounted differently, we have to treat them a little bit differently. When you are replacing the circuit board on the newer style M9, M11, you need to send us the mounting bracket that it came with. 
There were two different styles of mounting brackets used by Midmark. We want to be sure that you get the exact bracket that went with that circuit board. So that's something that we ask you to do. On the older style machine, the circuit board sitting over here on the other side, the bracket didn't change. We just ask you to send us the board and uh, you don't, the bracket itself doesn't need to be uh, included. However, on the older style machines, there is a, a ground path that goes through the metal bracket from the chassis. So if you are going to be removing this circuit board, it's imperative that you also take a look at the mounting bracket, especially the surface between the mounting bracket and the base of the machine. Rust will tend to build up under there. That will break the ground path uh, from the one screw that mounts the circuit board to the bracket. Once that ground path is broken, you'll start having errors with your le water level sensor and your temperature probes. A blown fuse on a circuit board, either style circuit board, frequently indicates an external problem to the circuit board. So before you install a new circuit board, you need to ensure that all of the external devices connected to that board are electrically functional or, or at least not shorted. You need to check your coils and your valves to make sure that they aren't shorted to the chassis. You need to check the various door opening devices. On the newer style machine, it's a drive motor. On the older style machine, it's a pulse solenoid. Both of those devices can short the case, causing the fuses to pop. We also have a door switch that can become shorted to the case. The heating element itself can also cause these fuses to pop. A cracked, shorted, or damaged heating element allows leakage to the case of the machine, and that can cause problems. Okay, uh, looking at the individual valve assembly on the newer style M9, M11s, and this does apply to the older machines as well. Um, failure of the fill valve frequently causes water to show up in your chamber when the machine is not functioning. Water leaks past the valve. Failure of your vent valve uh, prevents air from escaping the chamber machine won't ever vent properly. When working on these valves, you do not want to grab the internal stems with a plier. Anything that can bend that internal stem will keep the piston from moving freely. That's why we use spanner wrench only to open up these assemblies. You want to make sure if you do go into these valves that everything is clean, that the sealing surfaces are clean and undamaged. And in particular, you want to take a look at the sealing surface within this brass block to make sure that it doesn't have any chips in it, or the sealing surface within the top of the uh, bonnet on the vent valve to make sure that it is uh, solid, doesn't have any uh, gunk built up on it, or chips ensure, to ensure a tight seal. Okay, moving to the actual valves. Now, Midmark made their valves in two different styles. Um, the, the, the way they changed them over the years was they installed internal to the coil. Um, these they installed internal to a, the coil a full wave bridge rectifier. These valves at 100, run at 120 volts AC. If you install a bridge rectifier within the coil, you immediately take that AC and convert it into a DC voltage. And that means that the internal parts to the valve are different. You cannot interchange the internal parts of an AC valve with a DC valve. The way you know if the valve was full wave rectified 
is, as you can see on the image, there it will actually say FWR in the voltage specifications for the valve. And that will determine which kits you are going to install in the machine. Also, it will determine what resistance you get when um, you are um, measuring the coils. On, on a AC valve, you will get um, an actual coil spec, but on the full wave rectified, you will get a 3 to 4 mega ohm reading for a working coil because you're actually measuring the reverse resistance of the diodes in the full wave bridge rectifier. Um, before we go any further, I'd like to find out if we've got any questions. How are we doing on questions? Yes, we do. Uh, looking here at the list. Okay. Um, how can I tell if the air so solenoid is working properly? I think we already did that one. Okay. Sorry about that. Next. Where is the best spot to place four test strips? Wow, okay. Um, that is a good question. Um, test strips are used uh, as validation for a cycle. Um, you know, I think I'm going to hold off answering that just a little bit till we get to a further slide. Uh, let's skip over that one just for now, but I promise to get back to it. Are there any other questions? Yes. Have you heard of trays splitting at the corners for these units? And if so, what's the potential cause? Um, to tell you the honest truth, I have not. The trays are very robust. Um, I don't really know why that would happen, but I can tell you as part of the manufacturing process that the trays are stamped out of sheets of metal. And that would probably be the weak spot, the thinnest wall spot. So I would imagine it's a mechanical failure. And um, I don't know that there's really anything that could be done to prevent that. Um, it is, however, something that could be re-welded if you needed to do that, or the trays can also be replaced. Okay. Another question here. What type of cleaner do you recommend for all American pressure cooker type sterilizers? Um, anything that has stainless steel that is not a uh, Midmark, Pelton, or Tutnauer can be cleaned with non-chlorinated cleaners. There are some brand names out there. Um, if you buy a cleaner that is good for stainless steel appliances, you can use it in a pressure cooker style sterilizer, uh, or you can use it on the uh, frame, uh, door, and chamber of any other sterilizer as long as it's completely cleaned out before you run the machine. Anything that smells like chlorine should never be used on any stainless steel product. The chlorine takes away a layer off the stainless steel called a passivation layer that exposes the pores in the stainless steel and will directly lead to rusting and corroding of the stainless steel. You should never use anything with chlorine near anything that's made out of stainless steel. Okay, uh, from this attendee, we've had a third-party service company tell our users to clean these units like the Pelton and Cranes, aka to put the cleaner in the water reservoir. But Midmark's manual says cleaner should go in the chamber only. What are your thoughts on this? Um, that is exactly correct, and it involves the difference in the chemistry between those two products. One of them actually is a foaming cleaner, and it will do no good if you put the Midmark cleaner in the reservoir. It's not ever going to uh, uh, behave properly. It needs to go in the chamber so that it can actually be activated by the machine and do its job. The Pelton cleaner can go in the reservoir. That isn't a problem. And uh, it is designed for that usage. Of course, 
even in the mid-mark machine, the cleaner eventually gets washed back into the reservoir where it needs to be drained, um, the water needs to be flushed through the reservoir, and that cleaner needs to be removed from the reservoir so that you don't keep cycling it onto your instruments. Okay, one more question here. What is the most common problem with the circuit board? The most common problem on this circuit board are there are a series of relays built on the circuit board. Those relays control the flow of electricity to and from the heating elements, the flow of electricity to and from the valves, and the um, flow of electricity to the door opening device if it's got one. The other common mode of failure on these boards is the pressure transducers. Um, they eventually go old, they become brittle, they can crack. Um, those are probably the biggest concerns that we have found on the circuit boards. Um, yes, you can on this newer style board that we're looking at here, you can actually build up some oxidation within this a connector at the bottom of the board. That's something to pay attention to, but it's not a, a, a very common failure. And occasionally we will have some failures within any um, micro switches that are mounted on the boards, but that's even less common. Um, so there are, in, in the process of refurbishing these boards, there are a series of parts that are replaced. The relays are all replaced, and um, we make sure that they have a functional lifespan. Now, and the pressure transducer is placed as well as part of the refurbishment. Okay, one more question here. To perform a full refurbishment on either old or new units, which kits do you recommend? Um, that goes into a little bit more detail than I'd like to go to at this point. It depends upon the level of the refurbishment that you'd like to do to the machine. We do have a planned maintenance kit that includes the door gasket, dam gaskets, and chamber filters. Those all need to be replaced on a yearly basis. But if you're going to refurbish the valves themselves, we need to identify what style valves you got so we can give you the correct internal uh, materials for that valve. Also, you have the options of just outright replacing the entire valve, including the brassware and the housing and the coil, based on the uh, wear of the valve. If you believe that you're having a problem with the brass body of the valve, the only way to actually fix that is to replace the entire valve. Also, if you are working on the newer style uh, valve assembly. Um, we have it available as a complete uh, valve assembly, including both valves and the uh, brass block, or we have broken it down into individual kits. And if you need further information, you need to contact us in technical support, and we'd be happy to tell you uh, what exact parts you need based on your machine's uh, serial number and uh, what, we, what you know about whether the valves are full wave rectified or not. Okay, um, I'm going to go ahead and move along. Um, we have a door motor on this machine. The difference between the M9, M11 and the M9D and the M11D is the D-style machines do not automatically open the door, so you would not have this device. You wouldn't have a pulse solenoid on the original machines either. Um, so let's see, when you're installing the door motor, make sure you get these pins into the right hole. They determine whether it's an M9 or an M11. Uh, we're moving on to the front of the machine, to the door itself. We have our door gasket and our dam gasket. The, uh, the door gasket is reversible, so if you have a slight leak, make sure you give that a try. You can actually rotate it 90 degrees as well, turn it completely around. The dam gaskets came in two different styles based on um, 
the version of the machine. There is a version of the M9 that has a metal bracket on the front of it, and there's a separate dam gasket for that. You need to be sure that you're getting the right dam gasket for the right style machine. Now, um, Midmark sells a wire that they install into the Midmark door gasket. We do not sell that wire, and we do not believe that the RPI door gasket needs the wire. Um, we, we don't support that. Okay, moving right. Oops, wait, there's one more thing I meant to say. Um, behind this um, metal plate, there is a piece of insulation that's makes the, that keeps the door uh, from becoming a, uh, a heat sink. Um, that piece of insulation gets pressed when you shut the door and at some, in some situations can become um, unevenly pressed. One side gets pressed in a little bit more than the other side and that can cause uh, door leaks. So if you have a door leak that isn't solved by replacing the door gasket, you might want to consider replacing the insulation pad. One thing about replacing this insulation pad, you have to remove the plastic frame of the door and this metal plate, and there is a welded stud on the back of this uh, uh, door assembly. And uh, be very careful when tightening the nut that holds that stud in place. You don't want to unweld it from the door. That cannot be repaired. Um, also, we have on um, the machines that automatically open the door, a door spring. This device actually pops the door open. We include two of them in our planned maintenance kit, and if you find that the uh, machine is not popping the gasket strong enough, they can be doubled up. Okay, now we're looking at the front of the machine. This is where the water is put into the machine. Water and sterilizers is very important. You need to be using only distilled water. You do not want to use mineral water, spring water, drinking water. All of those contain, contain dissolved minerals that will accumulate on the chamber of the machine, on the instruments of the machines, and within the valves. The other thing you want to avoid is using deionized water. Deionized water has all its free ions removed, and it will look for free ions anywhere it can find them, including the metal of the chamber, the metal of the tubing, or of the valves. You cannot use deionized water in any sterilizers. When you're filling the water up, it needs to be within the green range on this water level uh, measuring chart, but you do not want to fill it any higher than one inch from the top. When the machine vents, it boils the, it bubbles the water within the reservoir. That can actually cause this water to bubble, and you, if you fill it up too high, it will spit water out of the top of this tube onto your counter. Um, we have a door switch. That actually tells the machine when the door has been closed and sealed. And built into the switch uh, assembly is a piece of spring steel that has a slight bend on the end of it. If that spring steel breaks, you'll get intermittent failures on your door switch. If replacing the door switch doesn't solve your problems, take a look at that piece of steel of steel and make sure that that right angle bend is still in place. Back here in the rear of the machine, we have our um, temperature sensor. That's the device over here on the right hand side. It needs to be clean and not have any calcium or lime built up on it. We also have uh, our water level sensor that's this round disk. The water will fill up until it contacts this device. And we have a series of two filters that keep material from the packs or the instruments from getting into the valves. 
uh, that will extend their life spans. We replace those on a yearly basis, or they can be cleaned in an ultrasonic cleaner. Okay, um, again, we talked earlier about what can be used to clean the chamber of a sterilizer. You never want to scrub it with anything that contains chlorine. Um, but if you need to scrub something out of the chamber, there are powdered stainless steel cleaners that you can use uh, with a Scotch Guard pad, and you can scrub off those individual spots as you need to. Also, you can scrub this ceiling surface so that um, we are not uh, having anything sticky pulling the door gasket out. Um, as part of the monthly maintenance, you need to clean the machine. Um, you should be doing qualification testing, uh, spore testing um, with runs to be sure that the operator is not overloading the machine or choosing the wrong cycle for what they're putting in the machine to uh, ensure that they, not only did the machine function properly, but all of the material within the sterilizer is sterile. We have a heating element on the bottom. The heating element can become cracked. It can become rusted. Um, it can become bent, damaged. You can develop wear spots in it. You want to replace that heating element if you see any of that occurring. Um, you do not want to put a sterilizer on a GFCI breaker because of this heating element. It can develop leakage current uh, th through the walls of the heating element, through the walls of the sterilizer, and it will trip a GFCI. Um, so the water level sensor needs to be electrically isolated from the chamber in order for it to function properly, in order for it to complete the circuit. The ground path needs to be uh, fully established between the circuit board and the frame of the machine. And the, there is a seal within that water level sensor keeping it isolated from the chamber that needs to be solid without any leaks. Water level, the, the uh, temperature sensor needs to be clean. Um, it is a resistive device, and you can check its function using an ohmmeter disconnected from the circuit board. Plug your ohmmeter into the two connections uh, on, on the cable at the circuit board, and you can literally touch this device and watch its resistance change as the heat in your hand heats it up. Um, back to the question you asked earlier about where you put your uh, uh, strips. You should always use a tray and a tray rest within the sterilizer. What we are showing here is the tray with our lag thermometer that you are going to use as a testing device to verify that the machine has reached operating pressure. It needs to be elevated off the bottom of the chamber and you would want to also put, uh, when you are actually operating the machine, any uh, uh, test strips or spore strips or spore tests in the center of the chamber, as close to the center of the chamber as possible, on a tray. You never want to put them on the bottom of the uh, tray rest or a tray assembly. And uh, you wouldn't want to put them up in the top, they really need to be centered within the uh, chamber. Okay, um, that completes our uh, technical side of the program. Um, I'd like to go ahead and uh, point out um, that we do have tech support available on our website as well as one-on-one -on, -one on telephone free of charge. And we uh, do have maintenance kits for these machines, and you will find um, information about those in our various posters on our technical support page on our website. Um, I'd like to go ahead and take any questions at this point. OK, Neil, we do have a couple questions here. What is the best technique to use to install a door gasket? 
In the case of the mid-mark, the door gasket goes in very easily, and you can just uh, lay it into the door race starting at the top and uh, putting the bottom of the gasket in. Kind of look at it as a clock. You'd be starting at 12, you'd put the 6 in, and then you would put the 3 and the 9 positions in, and that will spread the material uniformly around the uh, frame of the door uh, race. On the Pelton machines, that becomes very critical. If you were to put a Pelton gasket in starting at 12 o'clock and working around the clock face, you will wind up with about an inch too much material. In order to avoid that, again, you start at 12, you put the, the top in, then you go to 6, you put the bottom in, you go to 3 and 9, you put the sides in, and you'll have four loops of material, and you press those four loops in place, spreading the um, overage in the gasket uh, uniformly amongst the four quadrants. Silicon is a uh, material that, as it heats, tends to shrink. So all door gaskets are sold to you slightly oversized so that they will shrink into place. Now, on a Tutnara machine, you also have to pay attention to uh, the shape of the gasket. The Tutnara door gaskets are slightly wider on one edge than the other. The wider edge, or the keystone edge, uh, the wider side of the keystone, I should say, goes into the door frame. Um, if you put it in backwards, the gasket will the door gasket will leak and will pull right out of the door race. So you want to put it with the wider side into the door frame. Moving along. Okay, Neil, we do have a lot of questions that the folks asked, but I don't think we're going to be able to get to them all on the call today. So. Any of the attendees that are listening, if we didn't get to your question, RPI will follow up offline. Uh, we'd, we'd like to go ahead and thank you, Neil, for your time and knowledge today. It's been a great presentation. Uh, again, Technation would like to thank our sponsor, RPI. You can visit rpiparts.com for more information about the company and to download a copy of today's presentation slides. A reminder that your participation in today's presentation makes you eligible for one and a half CE credits. You will get a survey about today's presentation on your computer screen immediately following the conclusion of the webinar. Once the survey is complete, we will email you your certificate with the CE credit within one week. If for some reason you do not receive the survey, feel free to email us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. And that's all we have for today. Thank you very much for attending. And um, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to call me in the Technical Support Department. Um, I am extension 127, and I will be uh, answering questions uh, as, uh, you, as they're presented. Um, I want to thank Tech Nation for allowing us to do this. and. Uh, uh, thank you all for attending. Okay, have a great day, everyone.